as Donna uh, brings the other slides up, let me introduce another very special person who has arrived in the room. That's Peter Girdler from HNTV. Peter is the vice chair of the APTA High Speed Inner City Rail Committee. We'll be transitioning into the chair after David gets tired in June of next year at the rail conference. And Peter, it's nice to have you here. Now let's uh, let's hear from Stan Feinside. Stan is a, a very cerebral member of our group. He's a research associate and also, well, I know you're all cerebral, but Stan is very cerebral. And uh, uh, Stan, the reason why I say that is because he's an adjunct professor with the Mineta Transportation Institute. He's also a research associate. So he's leading studies, and he's going to be summarizing one of the studies, which is an international study, uh, which he's about ready to publish. Uh, Stan Feinsod, Director, High Speed uh, Rail Connectivity Center, Mineta Transportation Institute, among many other things. Less cerebral every year. <laughs> and I know half of you were trying to figure out who he was talking about. So I, I'll be the cerebral part of me. Uh, thank you very much, Rod, for the introduction and uh, overstatement of my cerebrality. Uh, this is a great panel. I, I'm the last speaker. All of you should shake up a little and try to stay awake. It's, it's, uh, it's only 2 o'clock in California. Uh, it, it's 5 o'clock in Washington, and no one's going home because no one's at work. Um, so I'm, I'm here to talk about a research project. And as a research project, it doesn't have the, uh, the concreteness of uh, the California project, uh, the, the uh, impact of the Philadelphia story, uh, the, the uh, vision of the Texas project. But it's, it's research that might make a contribution to uh, all of our work around the United States to improve uh, our intercity and high-speed passenger rail systems. Uh, what we're doing is looking at international experience, researching that experience, developing benchmarks about connectivity, and then at the end, applying those benchmarks to California. We're not done. I wish we were more ready to publish than, than we are. We have a little bit of time. I just got an extension, Rod. Uh, Dr. Philbrick was uh, generous enough to give us a bit of an extension. Yeah, no cost extension. That's right. We're all now working for free. But that's, that's the research world, right? Uh, let's talk about what is connectivity. We're looking at connectivity not from uh, the s connecting the state, uh, connecting the major urban areas, but more like uh, the connectivity that, that Drew Galloway talked about. Connecting the portal station, the terminal, to the uh, urban area and its environs. Feeding to and from the high-speed rail station. Providing paths from that station into the urban area, from the urban area into the high-speed rail station. Linking terminals to destinations and origins. Linking with existing transportation options and thinking about, in the context of a 15 or 20 year program, what new uh, connections are necessary. And the attributes of quality. I try to talk about quality whenever I talk about connectivity. And I think, uh, Drew, you illustrated some of the quality dilemmas that uh, you can see when you go to 30th Street uh, today, but not tomorrow. So what is quality in, a, in, a connect, in, a, in connectivity at a terminal station? Is it friendly to the user? Can the user get around? Do they know where to go? One of the things that public transportation does the most is so confusion. So we are trying to attack confusion. We are trying to provide information on the fly. Someone gets to the station, they immediately need information. 
We want to try to design in convenience moving from or to the high-speed rail platform in a convenient way. We need path marking. People need to know exactly where to go. Where does this staircase take us? I only know one place in the world where where does this staircase take us is answered all the time, and that's in Paris. And everywhere in China, of course. How to pay. The biggest barrier in, the, in connectivity and perhaps in all of our urban systems is the fare, fare barriers. How easy is it to access the connecting mode? How do you provide knowledge of schedules? When does the bus, when does the train, where's the taxi? How do I use it? And then uh, using the technological advances of the last 10 minutes or six weeks or five minutes, how do you push information to people? The, the, the mobile phone, we, we call it a mobile phone, the smartphone, it isn't that anymore. I don't know, we need a new word. What is that thing that gives us so much utility? And here we have, uh, and again, I'm going back to Drew. Drew was giving us some really excellent new examples of using that technology to, to add quality to connections. So our work started in, with international experience. We actually reviewed 64 high-speed rail terminals and stations around the world. Belgium, China, France, Germany, Italy, Japan, the Netherlands, South Korea, Spain, Sweden, Taiwan, Turkey, the UK. 64 stations. I read that well, right? That's, that's why I'm cerebral. And for each of those stations, we attempted to determine 25 parameters. Uh, and and this, this is uh, a database. It's a database that we can mine for several different reasons. But we have location descriptions. We know how many high-speed rail or intercity rail stations are in that city. We're trying to determine and, and post the density of the uh, areas. Uh, we want to understand the functions that the terminals have within them, uh, the parking available close by, what is the population of the area, what exactly is the station activity in uh, people coming and going at the station. And then what are the connecting modes that are available and what are, what's their frequency? Taxi, metro, tram, streetcar, bus, commuter train. It's a, it's a detailed list of attributes for each of 64 stations. So we then are taking this database and attempting to do some analysis. We're trying to reach some conclusions based on this experience out there in the world, taking into account that our experience is extremely limited. But in these other places that we've studied, they have a lot of experience and a lot of success in uh, using high speed and intercity passenger rail to uh, do the things that we've heard from Mort and others today, bring places and people together, close the travel time gaps, make the actual uh, perception of, of time and distance disappear. So we find that we're looking at the low capacity uh, kinds of connections in taxis, with median capacity local or suburban buses, and then in high capacity tram and light rail. And then a, a, a last uh, kind of indicator, very high capacity when metro, regional, or commuter rail trains are available. So again, we've taken the data and we've, be, we've organized it in this way, and we've reached some conclusions and we're still looking at the data and trying to reach some more. Uh, High-speed service introduction in, in High-speed service introduction increases overall ridership, overall public transport ridership and improves the utilization of local services. There are lots of similarities in high-speed rail stations. The more transit-oriented the city, the better the connectivity. Station location 
and density around the stations are very influential. The more dense, the less parking, and the better connectivity. After high-speed rail is introduced, it does take time to introduce a full offer of transit connection services. It, it seems that planning and, uh, of programs and projects isn't perfect. Are you amazed at that conclusion? <laughs> <laughs> most, the most common modes, of course, are taxi and bus services. Every single uh, of the 64 had taxi and bus services. It was very common, it's very common that new local or regional bus services are introduced. Improvements made to the urban transportation system as the high-speed station, as the high-speed service is introduced. High-speed rail stations are used by a lot of travelers who are not high-speed rail passengers because of the connectivity and the modes that are available at those stations. And in some cases, they become destinations in and of themselves, particularly when the, when the uh, high-speed rail station is designed functionally as a very multi-disciplinary, uh, multi-functional uh, building, a facility that has shopping, that has offices, that has all kinds of services and amenities. Our next phase, which we are just moving into, is to look at three cities in California that kind of uh, epitomize the 64 that we've looked at internationally and are different uh, in terms of size and density. Uh, and we're going to actually interview local officials, talk about the current connections that are available to the railroad stations in those communities, talk about planning for the introduction of high-speed rail services and improved intercity passenger rail services, talk about what changes they believe will occur due to the high-speed rail systems. We're going to try to gather plans and programs for each of these communities. And then, in sort of the last grand gesture, we're going to try to apply our benchmarking to those three communities. And actually make the benchmarking available to all of the 27 California cities that will have high-speed rail. We will give advice to local officials and, it, and create a, be, a feedback loop based on that benchmarking. And that's the MTI research project on high-speed rail connectivity. By the way, as I understand it, we're funded by the uh, FTA. Right. Right. We can't forget that. So thank you very much. You're welcome.